always nice to get the applause before I say anything, just in case I don't get any at the end. Anyway, um, happy to be here. I'll go through a little bit of my background briefly because you guys are not familiar with me. I'm originally from upstate New York, went to college at the State University of New York at Buffalo, got a bachelor's degree in genetic engineering and minored in psychology, got a master's degree from Texas A&M in genetic engineering, and then a PhD from Addison University in psychology. I spent about seven years working in the genetic engineering field, working on the genetic modification of growth hormones for farm animals, and then also working on plant genetics for the Northrop King Seed Company. Hit my late 20s, decided that I wanted to make a career shift. I got very big into the motivational field, studying different speakers and trainers in regard to personal development, motivation. 96, uh, 1996, I started a research project called the Power Mind Project to study peak performers, people in the United States that raised themselves to the top 1% of their field. Looked at self-made millionaires, business leaders, scientists, inventors, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, trying to find out what their genetic traits were and psychological habits. Spent about 10 years on that research project, published a book called The Power Mind System. Don't need to buy it. It's all free on my website. It's all recorded on there, YouTube downloadable, etc. So uh, I toured the country for a couple of years doing motivational presentations and retreats talking about our power mind system research then i decided to develop workshops and seminars based on that research and align myself with colleges and universities throughout the Midwest to do training programs on leadership, management, supervision, team building, uh, personality styles, etc. About the past uh, five years, I've been pretty heavily involved in safety, active shooter training at schools and businesses and public workplaces, as well as um, doing training seminars on behavior-based safety and things like that. So in my, I, I'm basically a designer, researcher, developer, deliverer of seminars and workshops. So that's kind of my business. Travel around the country three or four days a week doing, you know, small sessions like this or half-day workshops or full-day full day workshops and things like that. So definitely happy to be here, talk with an engaged audience that is interested in safety, health, wellness, etc. So I'm going to go through some things that uh, I've been involved with doing training programs at companies, at public organizations in Minnesota mainly, government agencies as well, and then uh, hopefully share some ideas that might help you with your safety and wellness programs and things like that. So always keep in mind that just one idea could be some critical information for you. you. Like five years from now, you might say, hey, I remember that guy doing a presentation and he said this, and that was something that helped me, you know, potentially save your life, potentially give you some great information to help you, your family, your kids, your co-workers. So always be thinking that, you know, you're looking for that one idea. What's that one idea that could be something that's really beneficial to you and to your family, okay? I'm on part of a safety council for the northern section of Minnesota. We meet on a, twice a month talking about integrating safety and health issues uh, into corporations, into organizations, so I'll share some of that information with you as well. So my concept on this is the concept of a culture. You know, how do you engage people? How do you ingrain in people's minds to be thinking about safety, be thinking about wellness on a regular basis? You all have the potential to influence your organization. So you guys are here, you come to the meetings, you guys are the leaders, you're the drivers, you're the influencers. So you are the folks that need more training, you need more information, you need more knowledge, on how to do these things, how to implement these things, where to go for resources. If you want to instill a culture into an organization, it has to be something that's done in a systematic approach. It has to be done on a regular basis. 
okay? So, in corporate America, we've had many different types of programs introduced into companies, especially in the business management and the leadership management. Does anybody remember the FISH program? FISH was like huge for two, three, four years. Everybody's like, oh, we got to get the FISH hats and we got to do the FISH mobiles in our cubes and in our workplaces. And that's the, that's the new management philosophy in the, in the country and in organizations. And then, and then what happened to FISH? FISH is like gone. It's like, you know, if you, if you weren't around for fish, you don't even know what I'm talking about. You're like, oh, what's this? Here? You're shaking your head. I love that. It's like fish. Never heard of fish. What the heck is that? Yeah. Yeah. You're thinking of fishing. No, it's a management philosophy. So anyway, so yeah, there you go. Fish. Where's fish? Fish is gone. Okay. Anybody know who moved my cheese? Hey, raise your hands if you heard of who moved my, oh, there you go. All right. At least I'm catching up with some people. You heard of that one. All right. Good. So who moved my cheese? Well, where's who moved my cheese now? Who moved my cheese now? It's gone right? It came, it was a big deal, then it's gone. How about Stephen Covey stuff? Seven Habits, right? Huge there, you know, and Stephen Covey stuff, that's out, you know? So what is it? These were fads. These didn't get ingrained into the culture of the organization, okay? I don't see fish signs in front of corporations, you know, we go by the fish philosophy, or we go by the who moved my cheese philosophy. Fads, what do fads do? They come and they go. Hey, they come and they go. You know, you don't see people running around like this anymore or like this or like this. It's a fad. It came and it went. Okay. Culture shift is not a fad. It's a long-term systematic approach. Okay. Safety in general in most organizations is not a fad. Everybody's heard of safety. I mean, I, I worked in at Northrop King, you know, back in the 80s. And when I was in school as a little kid, we had fire drills and we talked about electrical safety and things like that. So everybody can remember fire drills in school. Okay, when you were, since you were a little kid, you knew about a fire drill in school. Right? And they still know about fire drills in school. Why? Because they do it on a regular basis. They don't do fish on a regular basis. They don't do who moved my cheese on a regular basis. But you do safety drills on a regular basis. Okay? So when you make a culture shift, it has to be consistent. It has to be constant. It can't be something that, oh, we're going to have this program for the next year or the next two years. It has to be something that we constantly educate, train, and instill in the minds of people. Now, this is a good thing because it's not like you're training people in something that's wrong or something that's bad. You're training people in things that can save their lives. If you know not to touch electrical wires as a little kid, that could save your life 20, 30 years down the road so you don't get electrocuted. If you teach people how to use fire extinguishers, that could save their life. It's something that's ingrained in them. It's something that they know consistently and constantly. You have a great opportunity in the workplace, in the work site, to educate and train people on safety and wellness. And it could very well save their lives, okay? All right, many organizations already have a model system for safety. They do things on a regular basis, talk about slips, trips, and falls. They talk about safety in regard to electrical safety, talk about safety in regard to back safety and back injuries and hands and things like that. So a lot of organizations already have things in regard to safety training, but you could always upgrade those things. You could always increase those things. You could always enhance those things. Wellness seems to be something fairly new for most organizations, okay? Past 10 years, I would say. You know, 20 years ago, they didn't talk about wellness, all right? That wasn't something that companies talked about, wasn't something that schools talked about all that much. Those of you that are involved with schools know 10, 15 years ago, you always had the candy machines and the pop machines and things like that. So wellness is something that has not been ingrained into our society as a culture shift, but it 
but it has started. The awareness has started, driven mainly by the healthcare costs and the healthcare industry, okay? So people are not, in general, educated about health and wellness. Just go to any grocery store and see what people are loading up into their grocery carts, okay? You see what's in there, you know, it's soda, cases of soda, energy drinks, okay, people living on energy drinks and things like that. There's a little uh, gas station not far from my house, a little Amcon gas station, and the semi comes every day and unloads about 20 cases of Red Bull and energy drinks. And I said, why do you guys have so much of this? And they said, oh, that's for all the construction workers and road crews. They come in and they load pallets of Red Bull and Monster and Super Freak into the pickup trucks. And I asked one of the foremen, I said, what, what's all this for? And he said, oh, that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner for my crew today. <laughs> so you've basically got people living on energy drinks. Now that, that's not healthy for you, right? No solid food. Okay? And then if they do eat something, that's late at night, and that's usually pizza and chicken wings. Okay? So people are not educated in regard to wellness. If you integrate the two, since people have known about safety and know they need to be safe in the workplace, this should be, fall under the same category. It should be the same. All right? Health and wellness, why is that not and fitness, why is that not the same as electrical safety? Why is that not the same as fire extinguisher training? Why is that not the same as any other safety training you would have? So it should all be fall under the same category. It should all be one thing. Workplace safety is always a culture. It's not a fad. Employee engagement is key. How are employees engaged in safety and or wellness at your workplace? Are they thinking about that on a regular basis? People in the workplace know how to do their jobs, okay? So the job training, once you've been on the job for six months, eight months, or a year, you know how to do your job, right? And a lot of people get bored with their job. They're like, well, you know, I do the same thing every day. You know, it's like I know how to do this stuff. They're not totally engaged on their jobs. So they have extra brain space, all right? So what do we do with this extra brain space that they have? Well, we involve them with safety, health, fitness, and wellness. Give them something to talk about in the break room. Give them something to discuss in the lunch room. Give them things to talk about that's outside of the standard shop talk, work talk, etc. Okay. Why do you want them doing that? Because it helps them with the shop talk, work talk, etc. If people get injured, if people get hurt, they can't work. Okay? Productivity goes down, costs go up. So you want people to have dual nature. You got a lot of capacity in your brain. Your brain can think about more than one thing. You can think about more than just work. Okay? Safety and wellness, directly related and merging in many organizations. So this is a nationwide culture shift that is occurring. And it's not going to be a fad. It's not going to be something that fades away. It's going to be something that is consistently used in organizations. Why do we want healthy employees? Well, we want healthy employees because healthy employees have less safety accidents. Okay. If you're healthy, you don't have as many accidents. You recover faster. In general, a person in good health recovers faster when they get some sort of an illness. They have less sick leave, less chronic illnesses, less fatigue, more alert mentally so that they can prevent and avoid accidents. They are more productive and they cost the organization less money. Okay? So all of this great reasons to be instilling a culture of safety, health, and wellness into the organization. And this does not just help the employee. This helps their family. This helps their kids. 
When you go home from work, if you attended a seminar, if you engaged in a health activity, in a safety activity, guess what? You'll go home and you'll tell your spouse about that. You'll tell your kids about that. You'll tell your grandkids about that. Most people don't know how to operate a fire extinguisher. They see things on TV, but there's some key features in operating a fire extinguisher. That would be worthwhile to share with your spouse, to share with your kids who may not have ever handled one, who may not have ever done anything with a fire extinguisher, okay? So educating, talking about with your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, discussing these things. That's how you ingrain the culture of safety and wellness. Not just a one-shot deal, not just a brown bag lunch, but a consistent, thought-provoking discussion, activities, integration on a monthly basis in your organization. The concept of you folks coming to these meetings on a monthly basis instills the culture into your minds because you gain fresh information from different experts, from different speakers in the field. Now when you leave here today, you'll be engaged on this stuff. You'll be thinking about this stuff. Next month you come to another meeting, they'll give you another topic to occupy your mind, to think about, to be discussing with other people. That's prime example of culture shift. You have an opportunity to do that in your organization on a regular basis. Activities to create organizational culture shift. So what are some of the things that you can do? What are some of the actions that you can take in your organization to instill a culture shift? Number one, internal lead teams, drivers from within. A small group of people, depending on the size of your organization, that are knowledgeable that are more trained that can then determine what the approach is going to be, what the activities are going to be. So you have to have some sort of a lead team, some sort of a driver. You can't just ask everybody to get in a room and figure it out. It has to be a small group of people that are the leaders of a safety committee, of a wellness committee, of a combined safety wellness committee. Those are the folks that are the planners. Those are the folks that are figuring out what we're going to do on a regular basis in our organization. How do we educate people? How do we educate people? We do it with flyers. You could have short flyers, educational flyers on any topic. Smoking, the, benef the problems with smoking, the difficulties, the health issues with smoking. Just little flyers. Posters could be posted up in the workplace. Slips, trips, and falls. Whatever safety thing you want to put in there. Active shooter safety, five points. What are some things we need to do in case of an active shooter? Most people have no idea what to do in case of an active shooter. Be good to have a five point poster up there so that people know what to do. They know a few things to do. Internet website links. Is there something that you could post on your company website that keeps people informed, that keeps people educated in regard to health and wellness? What about a newsletter where you can share internal stories, success stories of people within your organization, coworkers that have done things successfully, things that other organizations have done or other states have done that have been successful? Communicate these things with staff. What about training? Safety training is usually mandatory. Make the health and wellness training mandatory. Have everybody attend. Why not have everybody attend and learn how they can become healthier? Learn some tips on nutrition, okay? In-house or consultants. You don't know how to do it all yourself. Bring in other people. There's plenty of other people around, locally, nationally, that are willing to come, give you ideas, help you out with your plans within your organization, discuss things with the team leaders. Guest speakers on topics of interest. Again, this organization, model system right here, bringing in different people on a monthly basis to talk about a variety of topics. Okay? Demonstrations live on site. Again, I'll bring you back to that fire extinguisher training. The key on a fire extinguisher is you got to pull the pin. 
okay? When I was at Northrop King, we'd do fire extinguisher training every year, mandatory, everybody had to do it. You'd be shocked at how many people come out, squeeze the fire extinguisher and say it's defective. It doesn't work. They're like, oh, I'm squeezing it, it's like nothing's happening. Training day cannot be fire day, okay? You can't be sitting there going, hey, I don't know how to work this thing, it's busted, it doesn't work. It's like, pull the pin, all right? How about three steps on fire extinguisher safety on a flyer or posted next to the fire extinguisher so when somebody grabs it out of the case or off the wall, they remember, hey, I gotta pull the pin or this thing's not gonna work. My kids, when they were 12 and 13 years old, they didn't know how to run a fire extinguisher. I asked them, I said, you girls know, I got two daughters. I said, you girls know how to work fire extinguisher? Yeah, dad, that's stupid. You just grab it and squeeze it. I'm like, oh, here, try it. And they did it and they go, oh, this one's broke. I'm like, no, pull the pin. Oh, wow, why didn't they teach me that? Yeah, there you go. Why didn't somebody teach me that? Okay, all right. So you can do all kinds of things. At some of the organizations I go to, we do timed drills on active shooter. People say, oh, I know how to get out of my building. I'm like, do you? I said, let's put you on a timer. Let's put you on a 60 second timer and see how long it takes you to get from your work spot to the exit to get out of this building, part of the run, hide, fight training. I said, let's see how long it takes you. And you'd be shocked at the chaos. I went to one company two weeks ago. We did a short drill on active shooter. I said, okay. We put over the loudspeaker an announcement. We said, okay, you know, here's our drill, starts now. Total chaos. People were going to doors that were locked. They're like, oh, we thought this door was open. We didn't know you couldn't get out this door. So they got 10 people standing at a door that's locked. They didn't know it was locked because they never try it. They don't go in and out that door. They're like, why is this door locked? And I'm like, hey, it's good we had the drill, right? It's like, that's not an escape route, that's a trap. I said, you gotta know what doors are open, which ones are locked. They don't know how to get out, they're chaos, they don't have the escape routes planned, nothing, all right? And they're sitting there seeing this stuff on TV on a regular basis, they don't know how to get out of their own building. Talk about building barricades, oh, forget it, they have no idea. All right, so this should all be trained. This should all be done in drills, okay? Training day cannot be the day that you have a serious event, okay? All right, personal stories from coworkers and others, good and bad, okay? What are the stories? What are the things you can share with other people? Success stories, even failure stories. I was talking about this this morning. Um, my niece joined CrossFit. She's an MD at Stanford, and uh, she's in her early 30s, and she joined CrossFit. CrossFit, for those of you that may not be familiar, pretty intensive aerobic training at a gym. It's like 45 minute to one hour intense training. And uh, she's in a class with about 10 other people at an Anytime Fitness out in California. And this one guy joins up, he weighs about 350 pounds, he's my, my height. And uh, he starts trying to bench press 250 pounds and he has a heart attack right in the gym and dies on the bench. My niece is trying to do CPR on the guy as the, as the ambulance is on its way, dead on arrival. Now why is a guy in CrossFit that had never worked out in 20 years trying to do that? And then when they did an autopsy, they said he had 85% heart blockage, all right? So you don't join up for things like that if you haven't been pre-screened, if you haven't been checked out. I'm 55 years old. There's a number of my friends that have had heart attacks as they hit their late 40s and 50s. In every case that I know of, about seven of my friends, about seven of them, they all had between 80 and 90% blockage in their heart. Now, how would you know that unless you had a test done? How would you know that unless you had some sort of a screen done? So if you're thinking about doing a workout program, an intensive workout program, you need to get checked out first. You see the people on The Biggest Loser going through their intense activities and things. What they don't show you on The Biggest Loser is every one of those people was checked out thoroughly before they entered into that competition. They don't have 80% heart blockage when they're getting on a treadmill for two hours a day. They've been checked out ahead of time. How about your staff? How about your coworkers? How about yourself? When is the last time you have had a thorough checkout, so health check, so that you know how you stand? 
You know, what is going on with your body? What is going on with your coworkers' bodies? You don't know any of that stuff unless you've done some sort of screening, some sort of testing, okay? Well worth the time and effort spent. Most diseases, even a lot of serious diseases, are preventable if they're caught early, okay? So that would be something to be thinking about for yourself. You catch things early, then you don't have a problem later, okay? All right, let me back up here. So, YouTube videos, TED Talks, and educational videos. Hey, you wanna do a lunch and learn? Pull up a TED Talk. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minute TED Talk. Let people go ahead and have their lunch, but have something playing on a TV screen. Have something educational going, even if they just get a couple of ideas. They don't have to sit there and intensely pay attention, but always have something going. Break time, why not have an eight minute video, a five minute video that you can pull off of YouTube. YouTube is a great educational tool, costs you nothing. Okay, go seek out people that are experts on YouTube. Scan, look for a two minute video, a three minute video, a little guided exercise clip that's four minutes long. Watch that, go along with the, go along with the instructor on YouTube before you have one of your meetings. You're gonna have an hour long meeting? Why not start it off with a three minute little exercise video on YouTube? Go through some stretches, go through a few exercises, then sit down and have your meeting. Or end your meeting with a little clip. You don't have to do all this stuff by yourself. There's other people out there that have already done these things that can help you. YouTube videos cost you nothing, they're free. And you can get them on any topic. Exercise video, nutrition video, whatever it happens to be. Scan through that. Educate people, train people, okay? Manuals and guides, okay? And like I said, just little guides, posters, six steps to this, five steps to that. Just get people trained in. People want little bits of knowledge. They're not gonna sit down and read a 400 page textbook, but they can remember three tips for this, five tips for this, half a dozen tips for that. You wanna get people engaged? Contests. Contests and prizes, individual contests, team contests, make it a month long event that you're gonna have a team challenge within your organization. Pit departments against each other. Have them do some kind of a health challenge. All in fun, all in jest. The prizes don't have to be expensive. It's just the concept of getting people engaged. You'll be shocked at how many people get so excited as soon as you say you're gonna have a contest. They don't care about the prize, they just wanna compete. It's like, oh, our department can beat that department in the steps challenge and whatever it happens to be. My wife's a ninth grade science teacher in a public school and they have step challenges. You know, which department can the science te teachers beat the math teachers? It's all in fun. It's all in jest. But what are they doing when they're having that competition? They're all engaged. They're all exercising and they're all remembering the competition that they're engaged in, in regard to just walking, Simple things like that. So it doesn't have to be complex. We're not gonna introduce CrossFit into the organization. But we can do things like step challenges. We can do things like walking competitions, okay? All right. Tracking using charts and tables. Most organizations track their safety accidents on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. You could do the same thing with health and nutrition. Start tracking that with people, okay? Monthly events, they don't need to be large events. They could be a contest that spans a month, could be a guest speaker, could be lunch and learn talks with the YouTube videos and discussing those things and talking about those things after the video. Educational flyers and memos, simple things that you can do on different topics on a regular basis throughout the organization. Okay. All right, so. All kinds of exercise contests you can do. It's summertime now. You could do a variety of things in regard to that. Team theme events could be done. Fun events, even family events. You can try and do something on a weekend. Get people engaged outside of work. Retreats and all employee training. Uh, a couple of companies I work with every quarter, they have a retreat with their 
staff with their lead teams, two-day retreat. They talk about various issues, safety, health, wellness, things like that. <coughs> Talked enough about the fire extinguisher drills. Active shooter training, something that needs to be introduced now into all organizations. Run, hide, fight methodology. How hard is that to remember, okay? It's three steps, okay? But there's a lot of detail that goes with those steps. This is something that I'm currently engaged with, with schools, corporations, and organizations. Didn't have to worry about that 20 years ago. Gotta be thinking about that now, okay? So, doesn't have to be scary, just has to be knowledgeable. Awareness, always better than avoidance. Two of the students in Florida, recently, they were shot because they were in front of a door. Okay, they were in front of a classroom door. Why are they in front of a classroom door? That's basic training in regard to active shooter training. Don't ever be in front of the door, okay? Had those students known not to be in front of the door, they wouldn't have gotten shot, okay? One of the rooms where Nicholas Cruz was, uh, he entered the room, there was no barricade behind the door. They didn't build a barricade. They locked the door, but they didn't build a barricade. Why was there no barricade, okay? If they barricaded the door, he wouldn't have been able to enter the door. All those students' lives would have been saved. Just one idea can save your life, okay? Don't sit in front of a door. Build a barricade when you barricade yourself in a room. Two ideas right there. Most students don't build the barricade. Most people in the workplace don't know to stay out in front of the door or to build a barricade, okay? And there's about 100 other ideas that can help as well. But just basic training to help people. All right, healthy team cook-off, okay? Engage people, engage them in a challenge. Who can cook the healthiest meal, the lowest calorie meal that actually tastes good, okay? There's a serious challenge. That's a month-long challenge there. Before and after photos, success. Making healthy choices easier. This has been great in schools. When I was in school, this was your vending machine, okay? Now you go into a lot of schools and they're much healthier choices in the vending machines. What about the vending machines that in your organization? What is being offered? What is convenient for people to snack on at your organization? Healthy vending, that's been a great tool for many organizations. Get rid of the pop machine. Put things in there that are healthier for people. Make it easy for people to be healthy at the workplace. What about meetings? I went to a meeting in northern Minnesota about two months ago and they brought in a semi. This is 800 people at a three-day meeting and they brought in a semi filled with racks of donuts. And that was the breakfast. And the people organizing the meeting were super concerned that they were gonna run out that was their main concern. They were like, oh man, we only got half a semi with donuts. We got 800 people here. It's like, is that gonna be enough? Maybe we should have ordered a full semi. And that's, that's all there was for breakfast, was just donuts. And it was every kind of donut. So I mean, it was actually, I like that myself. All right, I shouldn't like that, but I mean, but I mean, I kind of like that. I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, look at this. <laughs> you know, I get one of each, you know, there's like 20 kinds here, you know, and I got all morning and that's what people were doing. They were getting like one of each. They get like a, a pallet, you know, of donuts and they're like, well, I got this one and then I'll go back and I'll get, you know, some of the other ones that I missed later. But I'm sitting there thinking from a health and wellness standpoint, oh my gosh, you know, a semi load of donuts for these folks. That's what we've got. No fruit choice, no nothing. And then if you wanted to drink, they had Red Bull, Monster, Super Freak, coffee. And that's it. So those are your choices. They wanted people to stay awake for the presenters, all right? But anyway, you have other options that you could do in the workplace for meetings. You got other types of foods that you could offer people rather than this, okay? How about stress reduction? That falls under your health and wellness also. What are people getting stressed out about at work? Is there anything on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, where people can reduce their stress, where people can relieve their stress. Some of the programs that I do, we've incorporated using clay, 
modeling clay, artwork, so people can do something with their hands. Stress reducer, still talking about the topic at hand, but introducing something that is artful that goes along with it. Amazing results. People are like, Dr. Mike, you're the only guy that has us do something with clay in a leadership class. And I'm like, why not? Hey, reduce your stress in the leadership class. You get a clay art piece, you go take, put on your desk. People say, hey, where'd you get that? Well, I got that at the leadership class. Oh, really? What'd you talk about? And then that sparks a whole discussion just from a little piece of clay that they made something with in a leadership class or in a team building class, okay? So creativity, allowing people to be engaged physically, allowing people to be engaged mentally, you're teaching. All along, it wasn't the clay piece of art that was the goal of the class. It was the installation of the knowledge in their mind, which was my goal. And did they learn it? Of course they learned it, okay? They learned it because they were fully engaged in a topic which might be boring to some people, okay? Nutrition education, oh my gosh. You know, here, here's one option for you. All right, and here, here's another option. You guys have a state fair out here? We got big state fair out in Minnesota. And uh, like a lot of the challenge is to eat your way through the food courts, all right? Anything fried on a stick, that seems to be the, that seems to be the team challenge, you know? It's like if it's fried on a stick. So if you're looking for nutrition education, pretty much avoiding the state fair food would be like one thing you could do to save your life. Anyway, um, but a lot of people are not educated in regard to this. And I was not always educated in this myself. I, I, I didn't start out as a nutritionist, right? That's not my thing. Okay, I was not educated on this. I didn't know what were good foods to eat and bad foods to eat. This was not my area of expertise, okay? But I got educated, okay? How about ergonomics? Here's something that's being used a lot in organizations, telescoping workstations so people aren't sitting in a cube or sitting at a desk all day. They can stand part of the day and the whole workstation telescopes. Didn't see this 10 years ago. I see this a lot now telescoping workstations for people that have to be on a computer for a long time. What about distance for your eyes? What about hearing protection? So a lot of things can be done in regard to ergonomics, workplace ergonomics, heavy area of research. Also in manufacturing, a lot of places people got to lift, turn, bend, do things. There's equipments made which will lift things for people so they don't have to bend over. It's already lifted for them. Hydraulics, huge areas of technology and manufacturing to make things easier and more efficient and more productive for an individual to lift things, to avoid twisting, turning, things like that. Lots of things that can be done in regard to that. Swivels, things that move, protection, personal protection. These are areas that help people, keep people safe, keep people from having operations and injuries. Signage and charts. What's your expense justification? Well, a lot of things are not super expensive in regard to health and wellness, so that's like a big benefit, all right? But your other aspect is look at the long-term issues. How much time are people missing because they're sick, okay? How much time are people missing because they have an accident at work, because they have an injury at work? How many people are on meds at your workplace? If you've got a workforce that's over 40, how many of them are on multiple prescription medications, which may not need to be on multiple prescription medica medication if they did a few personal changes in regard to their health and wellness? All right, let me give you a little bit on my story. So I told you that this was not an area of expertise for me years ago. I hit, I'm 55 now. When I hit 50, I had a stroke. And my basic diet for 45 years prior to the stroke was soda, candy, pizza, chicken wings. Once in a while, cheesecake, and then uh, pasta, okay? and meat. That's my basic diet. So I have a stroke. I recover from the stroke. 
mildly in a couple of weeks and I'm sitting down with a doctor and he's like, you need to be checked out. And I said, why? He said, well, you just had a stroke. And I said, okay. So they ran me through all kinds of tests. And I said, well, how's that look? And he says, not good. All right, so I'm sitting there with every test result, blood test result, full body CT scan, colonoscopy, endoscopy. I get all the results and everything's bad. And he says, what do you eat? And I told him what I ate and he said, oh, your problem is easy to solve. I said, really? I said, what's that? He said, don't eat anything you've been eating for the past 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's simple. He said, if you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, that looks good. I'm hungry for that. He said, yeah, don't eat that. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I talked with a doctor at the Houston Obesity Clinic. And I said, I said well, what are some things I can do here? You know, I mean, I, I don't want to die. And he's like, well, it's amazing you're still alive. He says, how much exercise do you do on a daily basis? I said, daily? I said, think it maybe annually, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, well, what do you do for a living? Well, you know, I do research on the computer and then I kind of stand and I talk. And he goes, oh, no. It's like just all bad, you know. It's like I said, it was depressing. For a motivational speaker, it's depressing. I was like, what? he goes, what do you do for a living? I said, motivational speaker. He says, wow. He says, it's depressing for me talking with you. So anyway, he gave me some ideas, you know. He gave me some talks and he gave me some ideas. And I had to make a mental shift, okay? In my life, I had a lot of things covered very well. I had finances covered very well. I had business covered very well. Family was covered very well. But a huge area of neglect for me personally was health and wellness, okay? So I didn't pay any attention to my health, ate whatever I wanted, never exercised, and just did whatever I wanted until it caught up to me when I hit 50. Now I consider myself lucky because I didn't die, all right? And I was able to recover, but I made some major changes, all right? And that's the sad thing with a lot of people is they don't make any major changes until they have a near-death experience, okay? So I encourage you as an individual and your coworkers to do the pre-checks, all right? Get things checked out ahead of time, all right? So, what I was able to do is get off the blood pressure meds, get off the cholesterol meds, and make most of the changes with diet and exercise, okay? So I was able to make dramatic changes, and you sit there and go, oh, well, that's you, Mike. You know, you were able to do that, but what about me? Hey, my wife did the same thing, all right? She didn't have a stroke, but she was not in good shape either. But we both went on the same type of thing. And it wasn't a plan. It wasn't a fad. It was just a methodology. It's like, you know, don't drink soda most of the time. It's like, I'll still have pizza. I'll still have cheesecake. But not every day, okay? And that's the problem. How many sodas are people drinking on a daily basis? Most people say, well, if I just drink three or four sodas every day, that's, that's not a big deal. I know other people that drink six. I know other people that drink eight. When I go and do seminars, I see people with monsters, super freak, couple cans of Coke. That's just the morning, all right? What about the afternoon? So sodas, candy, donuts, Pizza, chicken wings, fried food, pretty much everything I like, you know, can't eat that on a daily basis. Can't be your basic thing. And you have to exercise. And I hate, there's a couple of things that I personally hate, okay? I personally hate exercise, okay? I don't enjoy it. People are like, oh yeah, get your sweat on, you know? It's like, no, I hate to sweat. I'm bald. It runs into my eyes. I can't stand that, <laughs> all right? I don't, I don't like to sweat, all right? I don't like to sweat, I hate fruit, and I hate vegetables. So that becomes a problem for a guy that's talking on health and wellness, right? It's like, well, I don't like to exercise, and I hate fruit and vegetables. It's like, oh, great, what do you speak on? Well, wellness. <laughs> anyway. All right. Where to begin? So what can you do if you're trying to think, if you're trying to begin? 
what is costing money to the organization in regard to employee health and safety? So do an analysis and see where you're having issues, all right? So what's the bottom line problem? What's costing you the most in regard to your workforce? That would be a good area to start to try and tackle because that's gonna give you some bang for the buck. What are the obvious employee health issues? Okay, so what are some things that are just blatantly obvious? You know, do we have half our workforce smoking cigarettes four times a day, in morning, lunch, and in afternoon break? That's a no-brainer, that's an obvious thing. What type of injuries are we experiencing? Do we have a bunch of people having back issues? Do we have a bunch of people having carpal tunnel issues? Do we have a bunch of people having neck issues? So where are our injuries coming from? Where are our problems coming from? Do we have a particular machine that's a problem? Do we have machine operators that are all having a consistent syndrome or problem? What are most people eating? Okay, and more importantly, what are we as an organization feeding them at meetings, lunches, and in our vending machines? Do they exercise at work or are they just cube dwellers? Is everybody just sitting around? I went and did a seminar for a bunch of software programmers and I said, what do you guys do for exercise? And they said, well, our exercise is mainly chair exercise. And I said, well, what's that mean? And they said, well, we come in, we sit at our computer, we turn it on, and then we take our break after a couple hours, and we have like a, a candy bar and a Coke, and then we stay at our computer. They, they, a lot of the software programmers don't like to interact with other people and do everything on the internet, so they don't want to like get up and go to a break room. They just want to stay at their terminal. And then I said, and then what do you do? Well, then at lunchtime, <coughs> we eat our lunch, at our computer, and maybe we play a video game for stress reduction, and then, uh, and then we get back on our computer and we do our work, and then we have our break in the afternoon, and then we leave at like five or six. And I said, well, how often do you move? And they said, well, we don't like to move a lot, but like twice we have to move because we have to go to the bathroom. But other than that, and, and they've talked with their management about how they could have something in their office so they don't actually have to get up and go to the bathroom. They just go to the bathroom in their office and stay on their computer. And this is serious, you know? It's a, it's a whole group of computer programmers. They, they just want to go in and sit at their terminal. You know, they don't even want to come to work. They're like, well, can't we just stay in our bed at home and just have the terminal up on the, up on the ceiling and we can just work like that? I mean, they have no movement. I mean, zero movement, okay? And that's their thing. Now, talk about introducing an exercise program with them. They, they just need a walking program, okay? All right, what are the employees interested in changing? So. In a survey, what are people interested in modifying? Do they have an interest in a particular health topic or safety topic or wellness topic? How are they getting hurt? Like serious injuries, okay? The gentleman that spoke before me talked about injury accidents and fatalities. What is causing that? We need to be looking at those things because we definitely don't want our workforce having a fatality or getting a serious injury. So those are things you need to look at as well. And then the ergonomics, the long-term things, the chronic issues, the hand issues, the neck issues, the back issues. What are some things that are causing those things to occur from long-term use, you know, long-term, you know, people that are doing this for three years then develop this health issue. People that are doing this for five years then seem to develop this health issue. How can we prevent that? How can we do some things prior to to prevent those things from happening? Okay, so survey and analyze the workforce. That'll give you some insights into where you should begin, what you should start implementing, what'll give you the biggest bang for the buck, okay? The flyer that you have at your tables, I mean right on the money, right here. You know, your wellness script, culture of safety merged with culture of health. I mean, that's it. And you got a whole bunch more ideas on the back of that as well. So all in regard to prevention, all in regard to education, all in regard to 
activities that people can do at the workplace, at the work site. If you guys need to get in contact with me, my website is powermindtraining.com. I've got business cards and some flyers up here. Need any assistance in regard to health and wellness programs? That's pretty much where I'm focusing my efforts as well as the active shooter education and training, doing drills, knowledge for small children on up to workforce, government agencies, etc. Simple things people can do to be trained, to be educated, and to be safe in regard to your health, wellness, and workforce violence. Okay? All right. Thanks for having me out here. If you got any questions, come on up.